next pre presentation topic is uh, nutrition in uh, acute and chronic pancreatitis. It will be presented by uh, Professor Rowan Parks, University of Edinburgh, please. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it, it's lovely to be here. Thank you, Mustafa, for the introduction. Uh, thank you to Amit uh, Coker, a good friend, and uh, it's lovely to be back in, in Turkey again. Uh, my third visit now, and I've always enjoyed the hospitality, so thank you very much. Um, and can I just pick up on some of the things um, that were, were mentioned at the start? Um, Christos de Venice, our president of EHPBA, mentioned a lot of the benefits of being part of the EHPBA. Um, Amit and I sit on the, the membership committee and we're looking to expand our membership, um, really to bring together the network of EHPB surgeons um, and specialists across Europe, Africa. Uh, and there's an awful lot to be gained and benefits. You've already heard some of them mentioned, uh, as well as being a member of EHPBA, you're also a member of IHPBA, uh, and that gets access to the journal, HPB, um, to the website and all the online learning, MyHPB. It gets discount at the, uh, the Congress, the European Congress you heard in Amsterdam next year, the World Congress, which will be in Europe, in Geneva, um, later this year. So, so many benefits to membership. And I know Amit's been uh, encouraging you to join up, and uh, I likewise would wish to do that. Uh, it's a wonderful organization and uh, a great way of making many new friends. So nutrition in pancreatitis, we're going to try and cover acute pancreatitis and, and chronic pancreatitis. We'll start with acute pancreatitis. This is anything from a very mild self-limiting disease to one that is severe <laughs> and, and life-threatening. About one in four patients will develop either local complications or organ dysfunction. In some of those patients, the organ dysfunction is very transient, but for those that have persistent organ dysfunction or organ failure, it's associated with a significant mortality, 15, maybe 20% in that subgroup. Uh, Lord Berkeley Mark Moynihan, the father figure, one of the father figures of British surgery, and I quote said, it is the most terrible of all calamities that occur in connection with the abdominal viscera, a devastating disease, often in young, otherwise fit people. Alcohol and gallstones are the, the key ideological factors, but it's their effect on the pancreas and the systemic inflammatory response that causes damage and injury to other organs. And this is often what leads to the, the catastrophic consequences. So in very simple and broad terms, what is our management algorithm for patients with um, acute pancreatitis? Well, firstly, you have to establish the diagnosis. You have to assess the etiological factor and then undertake some form of severity stratification. In the past, that was often done by scoring systems. But essentially what we're looking for is those patients who have organ dysfunction, organ failure, or those that do not. So if they've mild, predicted mild disease, it will affect the sort of management pathway. Whereas if patients have predicted severe disease or, or, or ongoing organ dysfunction, those patients will need monitored, assessed, managed in a different way. And certainly in our uh, system in the UK, we have many, many hospitals who will manage patients with pancreatitis but there are specialist centers that act as a referral unit and at various stages of the pathway. In some centers, they want to get rid of these patients very early on. More usually, they will monitor and manage them in a critical care facility looking for complications. And when those complications develop, refer into a specialist unit. Um, and, and this will vary depending on the, the network. But what is then the principles of management. It's often based around what we do for patients with severe pancreatitis. This is the group that do account for the mortality. These patients generally do need managed in a critical care facility. They need monitoring of their vital signs. They often need organ support. 
and there are some specific therapies. What has been discussed and debated over the past number of years are these four areas, the role of ERCP in severe acute pancreatitis, the role of prophylactic antibiotics, nutrition and, and surgery. And we could have a talk on any one or all of these, but we're going to focus predominantly on, on nutrition. The traditional management of, of acute pancreatitis was to rest the gut and if things didn't settle down to give TPN. And as we heard from uh, Professor Adam earlier, we have to challenge dogma. Uh, and clearly that's what's been done in the area of acute pancreatitis. Because there's no evidence that resting the gut provides any benefit. And indeed, TPN is associated with a number of side effects. So where have we come to? Well, there's been numerous guidelines that have been produced, but I think this was an excellent one. It came out now a few years ago. Uh, the IAP and APA International Multidisciplinary Approach to Management of Acute Pancreatitis. And they looked at 12 topic areas, but very practically looked at a number of predefined clinical questions and tried to address those clinical questions. And so when we come to the clinical questions relating to the nutrition management or nutritional aspects of patients with pancreatitis, these are the questions that were detailed. When should oral feeding be restarted in patients with predicted mild pancreatitis? What is the indication for enteral tube feeding? What type of enteral nutrition should be used? Should enteral nutrition be administered via a nasojejunal or a nasogastric route? And what is the role, if any, for parenteral nutrition? So we'll just go through these, look at the evidence that was in these guidelines and update it with some, uh, some newer material as well. So when should oral feeding be restarted in patients with predicted mild pancreatitis? Well, it can be restarted when the abdominal pain is decreasing and inflammatory markers are not proving. And often that can be within 24 hours of admission. Many patients will have a mild transient pattern of symptoms and indeed their inflammatory markers start settling very rapidly. So grade to be evident, strong agreement in the panels. Uh, oral feeding can be restarted pretty much straight away. A number of randomized controlled trials I've looked at various aspects. This one looked at immediate oral refeeding with a normal diet, uh, and if that was the case, it led to indeed a shorter length of stay. Can you start with a full diet, or do you need to bring it up, starting on a liquid diet, then a soft diet, and build up to a full diet? Well, there was no difference in, in this randomized control trial. And again, no need to wait until the blood tests return to normal. Um, as long as the pain is starting to settle, as long as the bloods are starting to return to normal, you don't need to wait for them to normalize. You can restart oral feeding, normal diet, as soon as possible. What is the indication for enteral tube feeding? Well, enteral tube feeding should be the primary therapy in patients with predicted severe acute pancreatitis who require nutritional support. Again, grade 1B, evidence strong agreement in the literature but it's important to note it's for those who require nutritional support even some patients with severe or predicted severe pancreatitis can still take oral nutrition it may need to be supplemented but this is the group where you will need to start thinking about enteral nutrition and there's been a number of trials and studies two meta-analysis can be summarized and, and these meta-analysis really compared enteral nutrition with parenteral nutrition but showed that with enteral nutrition, there was a reduced number of infections, reduced systemic infections. There was less organ dysfunction, less organ failure. There was a reduced need for surgical intervention and indeed reduced mortality. As I said, most of those studies were in patients with severe acute pancreatitis, but importantly at the bottom, patients who can eat do not always require enteral nutrition. So this was one of these uh, random, sorry, the meta-analysis of the randomized trials. Um, and this is just some of the data looking at uh, the infectious complications, the graph at the top, and you can see that there was a significant favor of enteral nutrition compared to parenteral in reducing infection uh, complications. 
And likewise, uh, a reduction in mortality, looking at those meta-analyses. <coughs> so enteral nutrition is certainly favored ahead of parenteral nutrition. This study looked at the timing of that enteral nutrition. When should you start it? 60 patients randomized to either getting started immediately or within 48 hours of admission to the critical care unit or delaying for seven days the start of enteral nutrition. And you can see in, in their results that there was a significant reduction in the length of ICU stay, a significant reduction in pancreatic infections, significantly reduced incidence of multi-organ dysfunction, significantly in, uh, reduced systemic inflammatory response, uh, and uh, no difference in the requirement for surgery or indeed mortality, but certainly pointing towards starting enteral nutrition early if you need to give it. Uh, and that's so, certainly become our own practice in patients admitted to critical care because usually they will have some degree of organ dysfunction we try now to start them early on enteral nutrition. So what type of enteral nutrition should be used? Should it be elemental uh, or palinuric uh, enteral nutrition? What formulations? Well, either can be used. There's no significant difference. And a recent meta-analysis looking at over 20 randomized control trials shows there's no specific type of enteral nutrition or immunonutrition that improves outcome better than another. So it's often down to, to local practice. Should enteral nutrition be uh, administered nasogastrically or nasogeginally? Well, there's strong agreement that enteral nutrition can be administered by either route, um, but there's practical reasons that often a nasogastric tube is the simplest, and if that can be tolerated, it's often easier. However, not all patients will tolerate it, but it's often a good way to go. And the initial IAP guidelines, at that time there were only two randomized trials. There are now four comparing nasogastric or nasogeginal feeding. And comparing the meta-analysis of these four randomized trials, you can see in terms of target delivery of 75% of the nutritional requirements, there was no significant difference between NG and NJ. There was no difference in the risk of those patients going on to require parenteral nutrition. There was no significant difference in the risk to developing diarrhea and no significant difference in the risk of exacerbating abdominal pain. So nasogastric is equally effective as nasogeginal and if patients can tolerate it, it's certainly a more straightforward, easier way to administer enteral nutrition. The risk of tube displacement is also no different. So what is the rule for parenteral nutrition? Well, it can be administered as a second line therapy via nasogeginal tube, if sorry, nasogeginal tube feeding is not tolerated and the patient still requires uh, nutritional support. What are those circumstances? What type of indications? Well, when there's failure to meet nutritional needs either, Patients get very high aspirates from their enteral feeding, or they get profuse diarrhea, perhaps because they've got complex upper GI fistulas or high output losses. Those may be some of the situations where it's challenging and difficult to give enteral feeding. And therefore, you might have to introduce parenteral. But on our own practice, what we try and do is maintain a mixed pattern so we'll always try to administer even a little bit, five to 10 mils per hour of enteral nutrition, just to maintain the enterocyte barrier, the, uh, the gastric and uh, gut mucosal barrier to prevent intestinal permeability, bacterial translocation. So we will try and then administer, even if it's at a very low dose, a background of enteral nutrition, um, but on, on, in addition, provide some parenteral uh, nutrition if required. So what are the principles of uh, nutrition in patients with acute pancreatitis? Well, certainly for those who have mild disease, <coughs> or also in those with uh, predicted severe disease, if you can take oral diet, that is the preferred option, with or without oral supplements. Oral supplements can be administered. The stepwise progression is to move to nasogastric uh, enteral feeding, particularly in those patients who have predicted severe disease. They may have 
organ dysfunction, they're in the critical care facility, those patients should be fed enterally and preferably started as soon as possible. If they don't tolerate nasogastric um, feeding, again because of high gastric outputs, placement of a nasojejunal feed, feeding tube either placed radiologically or endoscopically and continuing feeding. And only if you have some of the very rare causes of challenging um, delivery of the enteral nutrition, consider uh, parenteral nutrition. So what about nutrition in patients with chronic pancreatitis? Well, in chronic pancreatitis, and there's certainly exocrine and endocrine insufficiency. And in time, malnutrition will develop. Over 90% of patients at some point will experience um, a, a degree of exocrine and endocrine insufficiency, uh, and therefore that will relate to malnutrition. Now the severity of that malnutrition will be dependent on their nutrient intake, but also on the activity of their disease process. And this can affect um, in a number of ways their, their pain. If they have significant pain, they may not eat. If they're taking significant ongoing alcohol, again, their nutritional um, uh, can have nutritional effects. But generally, they will have a reduced dietary intake. They may or may not have diabetes and uh, other symptoms leading to, to malnutrition, maldigestion and malabsorption. So what are the management principles? Again, just to take it back to basics, so there's firstly screening to identify patients at work, uh, at risk. When you've done the screening, that will select out some patients who will require a much more thorough nutritional assessment. You then need to plan uh, your nutritional approach to management, and that will often involve the multidisciplinary uh, approach involving dietitians, nutritionalists, etc. This is the type of screening tool that can be used, um, advocated by SBEN. Uh, the initial screening asking a, some, some very simple questions. Is the patient's BMI less than 20.5? Has the patient lost weight within the last three months? Has the patient had a reduced dietary intake in the last week? Is the patient severely ill? If any one of those four questions is positive, if you have to answer yes to any of those, then you do a much more detailed screening assessment, looking at the degree and the percentage of weight loss uh, and uh, the, the, um, their BMI and, and fit them into a mild, moderate or severe impaired nutritional status. And again, that will help plan what um, the, the nutritional care plan would be. So all patients with chronic pancreatitis should be screened. And for those at risk, they will then have a, a much more thorough assessment to work out their nutritional requirements, what their feeding regime is required, and then what the plan is to monitor for improvements in nutritional status with ongoing monitoring and adjustment as necessary. So the key principles again to treatment are abstinence from alcohol, um, adequate analgesia, good pain control, dietary modifications, simple dietary advice, pancreatic enzyme supplementation, and ensuring that the patients are complying, oral nutritional supplements, and that's probably required in, in about 10 to 15 percent or oral supplements. 80, 85 percent of patients will be able to manage with oral diet alone and maintain adequate nutritional status, but some will start requiring these more interventional approaches, oral supplements, 10 to 15 percent, enteral nu nutrition, um, perhaps in about 5% and, and parenteral very, very rarely, certainly less than 1% of patients with chronic pancreatitis. So if they need advice regarding uh, dietary input, um, high calories, moderate fats, high carbohydrate and high protein is what would be recommended and often we would involve our dietitian to help them uh, look at choice of foods and, and keep a diary. And, and something like this would be adequate for the majority of patients being managed on an outpatient basis. But when do you require additional support to, to treat um, nutritional impairment? Well, enteral nutrition is needed when the patient cannot ingest sufficient calories, often because of purely controlled pain, or they may have pyloroduodenal obstruction due to chronic um, fibrosis or, or inflammatory change. So if they can't ingest enough orally, you may need in the short term to consider 
enteral nutrition. In those patients who are progressively losing weight despite what appears to be sufficient intake, again, they may require a period of enteral nutrition where there's an acute flare up and they get acute in inflammatory symptoms on top of a background of chronic pancreatitis. And particularly um, the group to consider were those who are coming towards needing surgical intervention. And a proportion of those may need some su nutritional support prior to surgical intervention. So about 5% of inpatient cases of chronic pancreatitis may require this type of approach. And again, for those requiring parenteral nutrition, it's really when enteral nutrition is not possible, such as complete gastric outlet obstruction, some very complex uh, pancreatic fistula, uh, severe malnutrition uh, prior to surgery, again, when enteral nutrition uh, is not possible. So these are the principles of, of managing patients uh, with chronic pancreatitis who need some nutritional support. So in summary, a couple of quite good papers if you just want to review of where the evidence is summarized and synthesized. Uh, the IAP, APA evidence-based guidelines for management of acute pancreatitis, the section on nutrition, uh, and the ESPEN guidelines, now a few years old, but cover both acute uh, and chronic pancreatitis. And again, just to finish, to mention the World Congress, the IHPBA Congress in Geneva, Switzerland, in the first week of September, a real opportunity to to come together to hear what topics are being discussed, debated, and again, if you're a, a member of EHPBA, you'll get a, a discounted registration fee. Mustafa, thank you very much. Thank you for a good presentation. Uh, any question from the audience? Please. Ron, thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, I've learned a lot. And I was just wondering, we do less surgery for severe pancreatitis nowadays, right? And, but the all guidelines and all advices about the nutrition for pancreatitis has been designed prior this concept. I mean, uh, we were doing more surgery about 10 years or 15 years before then. And so do we have to change our attitude according to the treatment modality we have applied to the patients. This is my first question. And the second one is the interventional radiology and the other interventional things is, is replacing surgery, especially in a severe acute pancreatitis. And so it means we are not going to do any more surgery and we are not going to put any jejunostomy, for example. So we have to insert another jejunal tube or something. So, but the other aspect, we have to limit some um, oral feed because of the severity of pancreatitis or increased abdominal pressure. Are we going to be squeezed by ourselves in very narrow place? In, yeah. Do we have to change our attitude? What do you think about it? Yeah, Ahmed, thanks. Good question. So, so certainly, uh, you know, if I go back 20 years, we were doing open necrosectomies. That was the standard of care. And in, invariably, in all of those cases, at the time of open surgery, you put in a feeding jejunostomy. A very high proportion of those patients actually got complications related to the um, jejunostomy, all sorts of different complications. So I think moving away from open surgery has actually reduced some of those uh, procedure-related complications. So I think, yes, we don't... I can, can't remember hardly the last time we did a, an open necrosectomy and insertion of a feeding jejunostomy tube. So we are using less invasive techniques. But I think in our own practice we have moved now, if patients have persistent organ failure after 48 hours, they will get into our high dependency unit. That's just where they're managed and they're monitored. And we're now trying to start enteral feeding much earlier. I think if we even go back five, eight years, we would have given them five, seven days seen how they go, but we're now much keener to set uh, an, an enteral feeding tube in early and start some enteral nutrition. Be because these patients just don't eat, they don't um, keep up with their calorie uh, requirements. So, so we, we will try and get a feeding tube in, but we'll start with a nasogastric tube because the nurses can put it in and they can monitor it very easily. So we, we will start that as now as early as possible if they're in a high dependency or critical care setting. And it's only if they're not tolerating the feed, there's very high gastric um, aspirates, 
that will then move to a nasal, nasal jejunal tube. And again, that's usually placed radiologically. And if it's not successful radiologically, we'll, we'll get the endoscopist and endoscopy uh, to, to place it. So, so we have actually become, I guess, more proactive in getting a feeding tube in, in that category of patients that have um, persistent organ dysfunction. So that, that's our approach. In, in terms of uh, wh where this will go in, and, and the risk of intra-abdominal hypertension, it hasn't been a major, we haven't come across it as a major problem. There has been one or two cases where, yes, they've got very high pressures on bladder monitoring. Um, and, and we've never got to a situation where we've had to stop the enteral feeding, but these are some of the ones where we'll cut back on the volume that they get by enteral, and we'll probably use mixed and give some TPN as well. So I think each individual patient is different, but we always try and maintain a trickle of enteral feeding throughout. Thank you, Rod. Great talk. Um, just to say a few, uh, make a comment, and then I would like to to hear your your opinion about that. I mean, uh, as we know, the the minority people belongs to the chronic pancreatitis mostly. In acute pancreatitis, it's not so often, except the chronic pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis was existed before, and acute pancreatitis. So what I'd like to stress on is that. In acute pancreatitis, and this is a confusion, it's not necessarily needed to give the daily requirements to the patient. So this should not prevent us by giving feeding to you because our target is about I mean, to, to uh, maintain the, the gut body. Yeah. So this is probably the reason that in most of the situation, the, the gastric root, it's, it's okay because it's not necessary to give the full amount of calories. Yeah. And I would like to um, comment on that. Yeah, no, I to to totally agree. And actually, if you look at any study, any of, any of the trials, the target nutritional requirements are always set at the uh, total normal for a normal person. But, but we know exactly as you so you don't need to get the 100% of the patients who have previously been fit and well. Um, you know, your normal patient who developed an acute bout of acute pancreatitis. So what you're doing is trying to maintain the enterocyte gut barrier function, exactly as you say. And therefore, even if you're administering a little bit, it's trickling in, uh, that will help that side of it. You're right, the chronic pancreatic patients, long history, long-standing malnutrition, often undernourished, it's a different category. So I, I totally agree with your comments. Thank you, Mr. Thank you for a perfect presentation. We generally focus on early period of pancreatitis, about especially in nutrition. But uh, if we look at the patients in long period, uh, they are in undernutrition for uh, sometimes two months and more. Would you like to say something about to oral supplementation in long period for their patients? Yes, so, so there's such a spectrum of, of illness, isn't there? There's uh, the very transient patients who'll be in in a few days. Um, there's then those patients who will spend a period in the critical care facility, but they'll still fairly quickly be on a recovering journey that will maybe take two or three weeks. Right at the tail end of that, we've got those who are in for months and months. Um, I think our record is, uh, well, it's over a year. Patients in with severe acute pancreatitis and all the sequelae and complications and so on. Undoubtedly, these patients, <laughs> undoubtedly these patients are going to require nutritional, and, and that will probably have to adapt and, and, and change as time goes on. And it's like trying to de-escalate them off that ladder. So if they have been at the end where they have had, to, you know, had a period with a mixture of TPN and a little bit of enteral nutrition, the idea is to get them off the TPN onto an increasing dose of enteral nutrition. 
And then the next step down is to wean them off enteral nutrition to get them to take oral supplements eventually till they're weaned off oral supplements and taking normal, normal diet. So I, I sort of management philosophy is you're trying to move from one category into the next category and gradually get back onto a normal diet. But in patients who are certainly in patients in hospital care for many, many months, they're going to be on some form of enteral nutrition for a prolonged period and even after they get home because their, their muscle mass they will be um, very catabolic for just such a prolonged period. They're going to need a long time um, to, to build them, themselves up to regain their weight and, and certainly that will re require ongoing oral supplementation usually after discharge from hospital for a varying amount of time. So e each individual is, is different but it, it's a long journey some of these patients are on. Thank you, Adrian, for the first part. Thank you. We are, we are going to keep on uh, to discuss uh, after 10 minutes, uh, coffee break.